Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place where we talk about all things sci-fi and fantasy, with particular emphasis on that most wonderful melding of science fiction and historical fiction, steampunk. As a result of my fascination with history, I have sometimes done some purely historical videos, and I've done a couple of those right, real recently, so I figured it was about time for me to get back to the fiction. Today's episode involves kind of a nerdy uh, anthropological idea and combines that with looking at how that gets handled in science fiction. This, this idea is called the Sapir Whorf Hypothesis. What, may you ask, is Sapir Whorf? Some of you uh, language nerds out there may know. Sapir Whorf Hypothesis is an idea that human language greatly affects the way that we think and behave. It's a bit of a misnomer because it's not, it was never formally stated as a hypothesis. There's rules for this, of course, in science. And the two men it's named after, Edward Sapir and Benjamin Whorf, both who um, basically lived and worked in the early 20th century, never co collaborated. They quite possibly knew each other, but they never did uh, work on any papers or projects together. The idea in particular uh, relates to some studies that Worf did, who, by the way, was also a fire safety engineer. <laughs> uh, and I think, I think languages and anthropology were more of his, of his um, hobby and his actual love of knowledge. And we Worf worked with several indigenous uh, groups in North America, like the Inuit, who we used to call Eskimo, just in case you don't know, and the Hopi, the, the tribe that lives here in Arizona, where I reside. Now, one of the things that you hear, one of the old uh, saws that you hear, is that the Inuit have a hundred words for snow. That's kind of a misquote of, of uh, Worf's ideas, but, but that's sort of thing he was looking at. He was more obsessed with the idea that the Hopi, in particular, because their language handled you know, past, present, and future differently, that they had a different perception of time, and it actually, actually um, affected their consciousness. If you want to see a little bit more of a uh, ex better explanation of this, there's a YouTube channel called Native Lang, uh, and specifically he's done several episodes based on the idea of uh, linguistic determinism, as they call it, or linguistic influence, if you're not quite as, as convinced. And so there's a, I'll put a link to this, his particular one about Sapir Whorf, which is a little bit more enlightening than mine will be. So we had this idea that, that a language determines the way we think. And this, although it's controversial, and even to this day, there are people who criticize it and uh, try to refute it. There were a lot of science fiction writers who were fascinated with this idea and, and said, wow, I've got to use that idea in a story. And so I'm going to talk about some of the most prominent ones who did this. And it's not, and some of them you may have heard about, some of you were certainly have heard of, some of them I've talked about before. Others are a little bit more obscure. Now, this is not the same as the use of Klingon, for example, in Star Trek, in the Star Trek movies. Klingon was a language that was invented by Mark Uckrand in 1985 for use in the second and third Star Trek movies, and it kind of became a cult favorite after that, and people actually started learning it and inventing more words, etc. But in that case, Uckrand took what he knew about the fictional Klingon culture, and their, their um, love of war and conflict, and turned that into a language that was, was centered around that, so that the Klingon culture had determined their language. The idea of Sapir Whorf is kind of the opposite, that, that the uh, Klingons had this language and then it turned them into warlike people. First example from science fiction is one you have definitely heard about, and one that I talked about in my episode of Dystopias, 1984 by George Orwell, published in 1949. This is the famous 
very depressing dystopian novel in which uh, all of humanity is ruled under these cruel dictatorships, three big powers. Uh, basically, they're very much like Nazis or communists, and that they rule everything. Big Brother is watching you all the time. And one of the ways that they control people is by the use of this language called Newspeak, which is basically English with some changes. They've eliminated words for freedom and liberty and so on that, to try and eliminate people's uh, capacity for free thought and introduce new words like crime think which is kind of a little eerily, which is eerily prescient, considering the current day when people get, get um, you know, canceled and terminated for having the wrong beliefs. The crime thing essentially meant you had the wrong beliefs uh, that con contradicted what the party said you should believe. <clears throat> and they also had like double think, which means that you could believe two contradictory notions at the same time. Another thing that's, I think, pretty common in, uh, at some of the uh, politically correct circles that I observe these days. And Newspeak also had a very simplified grammar and spelling that allowed people to talk and write and, and speak without thinking, which they called duck speak. Quack, 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 quack. You just kind of, you just kind of recite the talking points. Uh, does that sound familiar? <laughs> uh, before we get too depressed, I'm going to move on. Uh, the next one is along that similar vein by a, an author who had, who came from a different political viewpoint, but kind of ended up in the same uh, freedom-oriented, anti-authority place. Ayn Rand, uh, her novella Anthem, published in 1937. And this is a far future novel in which we have people that are very ruled by this very tightly, I mean, this very controlling bureaucracy and this guy named Equality 72521, mostly, your name is mostly a number because you know individuality isn't important. He wanted to be a scholar, but instead they made him a street sweeper. And so, so, and you're just not allowed to do what you want. And so he's kind of unhappy about that, but he's still, because he's inquisitive, he explores around and as he's sweeping up, he discovers a tunnel, and the tunnel has train tracks, but they don't have trains anymore. Uh, he later discovers elect an electrical device, which they've also abandoned. He tries to bring it back to the authorities. They punish him because we're not supposed to have that that um, technology anymore. It's forbidden. If you and, and in fact, if you if you follow the um, if you follow the record Rush, they were from the 1970s, big in the 1970s. They had this, a song that was very similar about a man who discovers a guitar. <laughs> in a world where like music has been banned and uh, they, the authorities punish him for that. But in this case, Equality meets a girl, she's like a peasant and a little bit of a, of a rebel, and he gets basically runs away from society and the girl joins him and they go to live in this house in the forest where there's books that have these old banned ideas and one of them is this word they've never seen before, the word I. Uh, it's a bit of a spoiler, I, I admit, but I don't think anybody doesn't know what this is about. I mean, this book's been out for a long time. So the idea here again is that they've eliminated the word I to eliminate the concept of an individual. Everybody's we, everything is, is collective. And there's no, there's no freedom, there's no way to, to um, express yourself as a single person. As we move along, we'll go from the political into a little something a little bit more speculative, something really crazy. And this is one of my favorite authors who kind of took it to the logical extreme. A Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein, 1961. He was quoting the Bible here with this title. And in this book, a human child, uh, Michael Val or Valentine Michael Smith, somehow he's stranded on Mars. And in this reality, there are Martians, well, they're a dying race because the Martian climate has become, you know, destroyed. And they were living underground, and so he was, he was raised by these last few surviving Martians who taught him the Martian language. Which, interestingly, had this very different perceptive, perception of reality, which allowed you to some degree to even bend reality in a way that humans would consider magic. 
So when Smith is brought back to Earth, he quickly becomes a celebrity and kind of, as well as kind of an outcast. I mean, people, uh, people are threatened by him, but he also, his followers start this, this cult called the Church of the Nine Planets, which I guess we'd have to change today to the Church of the Eight Planets, since they demoted Pluto. But this is, this is something that's, that really, it was published in, in like way back in 61, but it really, it really caught the uh, mood of the 60s because this church had this idea that everybody is God, everybody has a uh, part of God in them. So uh, it really, it really messed with that idea. He introduced the word grok uh, to the English language, which was very popular at the time, I recall. Something I would recommend checking out. Uh, again, on that vein, uh, another fellow who, uh, who I was actually friends with Heinlein, but and Heinlein's deceased, but this fellow is, is still alive. Heinlein was a libertarian conservative. This other man is on the far left, but they they had some ideas in common. They loved to argue politics back in the day when you could still argue politics and be civil. The Samuel R. Delaney, the, his book Babel 17, and he wrote it in 1966. I got to meet Delaney and get his autograph way back in uh, early 90s at a convention. Very, very exciting for me because I'd read a lot of his books. But not this one until recently. In this book, an alien, there's an alien code that the, the military badly wants to crack. The, uh, the alliance, the uh, basically the Earth Alliance of Associated Worlds are under attack by this mysterious enemy. And the enemy is performing all these acts of sabotage, seemingly at random, and these horrible things happen and they can't figure out how to stop it, but they have tied it to this code, Babel 17, which seems to, that it fills the airwaves right before this disaster has happened. So they hire this, this poet, writer Wong, formerly an academic, but she kind of dropped out of that to decode, the, to decode the code. She says, no, it's a language, and I'm going to need more time to, to figure it out, to be able to translate it. And I also need to go to another world to investigate where I think this is coming from. And so they have, if you've ever read any of Delaney, it's very bohemian and, and kind of strange cultures that he has including a, a lot of uh, strange sexual situations. Oh, this one doesn't, this one doesn't get explicit, although some of his do, so be, be forewarned about that. But this character, Rydra, she goes with the spaceship, goes to another world, uh, is narrowly and misses being killed, and meets this odd guy named the Butcher who somehow he doesn't know the word I. <laughs> That's interestingly familiar. And in this case, it's because he speaks Babel 17. That he's been he's a normal human who's been brainwashed, and with Babel 17 as his fundamental language. And as Ryder learn this, learns this, she realizes that it allows her to think much, much faster, like a computer. And so it's kind of a weapon in this language. And eventually transforms her into kind of a different sort of entity, one of these interesting transformative type stories. It's very fascinating and I was able to find an audiobook uh, version of this which was which was done quite well. Here's one that I found that I wasn't familiar with. I found it on a list of uh, Sapir Wharf related uh, literary works and an author I've read many books by but I hadn't heard of this one before, Jack Vance. He was extremely prolific. He wrote many genres, including writing mysteries as Elry Queen, believe it or not. And I believe he lived to his late 90s, so he wrote a lot of books. And not none of them totally fabulous, but, but all of them that I read were good, or good reads, good fascinating reads. This book, like a lot of his books, he, they, he paints a picture of this particular world, usually a human colony world, and the way that its culture and people have developed in some intriguing and fascinating way. But it's kind of, it starts kind of slow because he has to explain what these people are like. The world is called Pao, that's spelled P-A-O, 
And it's a lot like Imperial China in that it's a very static society. It doesn't change much. And they have this emperor called the Panarch who rules the whole world and it's very, very heavily populated, like 17 billion people. But the population doesn't change much because they, they have everything under control. And uh, the people are kind of docile, so they don't really care. They don't feel like they're being oppressed. What happens, though, is the primary character is named Baron. Interesting. Not spelled the same way as Trump's son, but he's the son of the Panarch. And the, his uncle assassinates his father, a very Shakespearean thing, and he has to flee for his life to another planet. And he's helped by a guy named Lord Palafox, who is this kind of wizard philosopher guy. In reality, he just has very advanced technology. And they have this world where they, a breakness, I believe it's called, where it's all like these philosopher king type people. They are very male chauvinistic. They import women from other planets for breeding purposes. And then they pay them handsomely for it, and they keep the sons and send, them, send back the daughters when they send the women back at the end of their term. So the Palafox has hundreds of sons, and and he and he takes Baron under his wing and, and starts educating him. At the same time, uh, Baron's evil uncle comes to Palafox for help, not knowing that Palafox is sheltering his nephew, and and because. Uh, Powell has been invaded by these barbarians who demand tribute, and that's intolerable to him. So, uh, Palafox says, it's go you're going to have to tolerate this for like a couple decades because we have to change your worlds so that they're, they can fight back. What he does is invents three new languages and three new cultures for military, uh, science, and um, trade. Each of them has their own language that promotes these ideas. Because the Pawnee's language is very, very static. The whole idea is it kind of paints a picture of, of things as they are and then unchanging. Whereas they, this military language is like Klingon. It, it like, you know, stab, kill, destroy, that sort of thing. So yeah, over the years, as Baron grows up and this project succeeds, uh, they're eventually able to kick off these barbarians, but then Baron wants to come back and reclaim his his patrimony as the true panarch of Pau. Pau, and, and it's kind of got some interesting ending with you know showing Palafax's very Machiavellian schemes, uh, which have some good and some bad to them. As I said, it starts slow, but it's definitely a good read once you get into it. Another book which I read. Uh, years ago was was something I really loved by one of my favorite authors, Neil Stevenson, Snow Crash, published in 1992, definitely a a cyberpunk, and the the uh, hero or protagonist is called Hero Protagonist, <laughs> and he's like a pizza delivery specialist, and this world is fragmented. Every like every like, neighborhood is its own country, and you have to negotiate this bizarre kind of anarchist. Uh, quasi-utopia. I kind of consider it a quasi-utopia. And one of the features in it, which I hadn't recalled until I got reminded when my research is that the ancient Sumerian language was considered a kind of a hacking language from, from old times. It was actually a code to to program the human brain. And, and one of the characters is a, it's a computer hacker. We see, always see lots of those in cyberpunk. Who gets his brain fried by, by too much of the Sumerian language. It's not the only theme in the book, but, but there's, there's a lot of crazy stuff in there. So it's just one of many fascinating ideas that Stevens puts in there. His, his books tend to be kind of complicated. Um, continuing the kind of political theme was a book called The Dispossessed, a 1974 by Ursula Le Guin, one of uh, science fiction's uh, most famous female writers from the time. This has a, a kind of a uh, rebellion of the moon against the earth, only it's not the moon and the earth, it's two similar worlds, because this moon can support life, only it's pretty barren, called, it's called Aeneris. And the 
people living on this moon are very anarchistic in kind of left-leaning sort of way. They don't believe in private property. So they've invented this language that gives them a perspective of uh, being against property. You don't have possessive nouns, for example, with pronouns. You say, this is the book I'm using or I'm reading right now, but you can't say this is my book. I remember enjoying it. It was kind of a kind of a fascinating take on how an anarchistic society might function, in particular a left anarchist society, which has always puzzled me as to how you could how you could operate without the idea of private property. But nonetheless, it's it's thought provoking, and uh, she actually mentions libertarians in here. So whether she, whether or not she she uh, was thinking about propertarian propertarian type libertarians or not, I'm not sure. But I uh, very much appreciated that at the time. And to to wrap this list up. There's a story, this wasn't a novel, but it was a, a well-acclaimed short story, which I just finished this very day. It's called The Story of Your Life by Ted Chang. I've read one of Chang's stories before in a steampunk collection. It was my favorite story in the collection, so I anticipated I'd really, really like this one. And I did, and I did, although although in a qualified manner. In fact, this, this story was made into a movie called The Arrival, and I think it was pretty recent. 2018, 2016, not sure. It's a kind of a bittersweet story, and you'll understand as I as I go along. There's this woman, uh, Dr. Louise Banks, and she gets hired by the government to translate this alien language. <laughs> Common theme. Only the aliens are have arrived. They're in orbit around the Earth, and they have put these looking glass devices at various cities whereby they can communicate with people. It's like they want to, they maybe want a cultural exchange, but it's hard to tell what they want because they're so different. They call them heptopods because they have, they're like radial symmetry and they have like seven legs or tentacles and they're barrel shaped and they speak off of an orifice at the top of their heads. And their language is very hard to understand. But uh, Louise figures it out over, over time and, and uh, especially their written language was very different it's kind of uh, ideographic, like Chinese or, or Japanese, but in a much greater way. All these symbols kind of play together in a huge calligraphic uh, picture, as if the sentence is all, is all together, in kind of an agglomeration. She soon figures out that the aliens perceive time differently than we do, not sequentially, but all of time, all at once. And you may be familiar with this idea from Kurt Vonnegut's uh, famous book, Slaughterhouse-Five. Only in Slaughterhouse-Five, it's, it's almost done ironically, uh, kind of satirically, as Vonnegut did. This is done very seriously. And the part that's, that's poignant and even heart-wrenching is much of the story is told in second person by uh, Dr. Banks addressing her daughter. And uh, she knows, as, as she's become more conversant with the alien language, she knows the future, and she, she knows her daughter's future, and she can remember things in the future. I remember when you'll be uh, 16 and you're going to prom, that kind of thing. And, and very sadly, she knows when her daughter will die in an in a unfortunate accident as a young adult. And this isn't a spoiler because because she mentions this again and again, but it's very it's very heart wrenching to you know as anybody who's ever had kids, this is all her only daughter, and she she remembers all these things about her daughter's life. I'm actually getting a little I'm actually getting a little misty as I'm saying this, and uh, and all about how much she loved her daughter and all the wonderful events of her life. And yet she can't do anything to change them. She can't stop this horrible accident. And, and in a way, she kind of accepts it with the, the way the alien mindset has impressed her human brain. And so I do highly recommend it. And I do intend to watch the movie based on this. But, but well, I'll probably need a handkerchief. <laughs> uh, seriously. So this has been my... Uh, survey of a number of 
science fiction novels and stories and novellas that were based on the superior wharf hypothesis, the idea that human language determines the, the way we think. And it can be used as a weapon, as a tool, as a means of political control, and even as a way to see the world. As far as my own viewpoint on that, I'm kind of torn. I can definitely see, as an engineer, I can definitely see that one of the primary ways that you learn something, that you'd be able to be conversant in some kind of technology, is by first learning the, the lingo. You first have to learn the terminology or you can't make any progress at all. And once you figure out the way what people call things, it's a much quicker road to becoming uh, fluent in, you know, database or, um, or um, Android programming or C Sharp or anything like that. <laughs> you have to learn what the terminology is before you can be good at it. At the same time, I've noticed we have a lot of social engineering projects uh, basically in our society right now where people are trying to change the language we use for example, to uh, uh, make the sexes more equal, for example, or to eliminate racial injustice. And to me, that seems like it's not quite so successful. You can, you can change words people use, but you can't change thousands of years of people's heritage. Or in cases of the, of the, of the sexes, you can't change the hormones and the biological programming that we have as um, gendered individuals. Not saying that we all have, not saying that we can't be individuals and we don't vary more as individuals than we do in groups, but still, to me it seems like it's, it's a, it's a um, effect that's bound to fail. We can't, uh, unlike Stranger in a Strange Land, we can't bend reality by changing our terminology, uh, by learning a new lingo. And some things are just going to remain the same. So human society is probably going to remain approximately the same uh, through, the, through the ages, unless we either destroy ourselves or we figure out some way to genetically engineer ourselves in order to be uh, smarter or faster or kinder to each other. Which would, that last one would very much be something I would be in favor of. So please let me know what you think about this kind of content, where I've been sort of trying to combine science with fiction and science fiction. I am, I am reading your comments uh, when I see them, <laughs> and and I am taking some of your suggestions seriously. So 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 look for some of these to come in the future. I thank you very much for wa watching my show. Please like and subscribe so we can get out the good word of steampunk. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.